In Chapter 3, we will cover how data are sourced. In this lecture, 10 topics will be covered. 1. We will review the research process. 2. We will distinguish between primary and secondary research. 3. The difference between pure research and applied research will be explained. 4. Four categories of research will be defined. Exploratory research, descriptive research, causal research, and meta-analysis. 5. The term big data will be defined. 6. Basic sampling techniques will be reviewed. 7. Sampling error will be explained. 8. Different types of systematic errors will be identified. 9. The concepts of reliability and validity will be explained. 10. The steps to take when reviewing research will be discussed. There are two broad categories of research, applied research and basic research. Applied research seeks to find pragmatic solutions to pressing problems. The goal of applied research is to uncover information to help decision makers make decisions. The second kind of research is basic or pure research. The goal of pure research is to advance knowledge, not solve immediate problems. Applied and basic research are not binary, which is to say the distinction between the two is not an either or proposition. They lie on a continuum. Let's turn to the research process. The multi-stage research process begins with the formation of the research question. Once the research question has been formulated, researchers review available research. After available research has been reviewed, the research design is developed. Among the things considered in the research design are the type of data to be collected, the statistical techniques to be used, and the sample size. The next step is to generate hypotheses when necessary for the type of research. Then the data are collected. Data analysis occurs after the data have been collected. The last step of the research process is to report the findings. All research starts with an unanswered question. Here is one example of a research question. How do Facebook users feel about the privacy of their data? Here is another research question. Which presidential candidates received increased Google searches after a debate and who is searching? And here is a third research question. What factors have contributed to the decline of cable TV subscriptions? Let's turn to secondary research and primary research. After the research question has been formulated, researchers review available secondary and primary research. Secondary research is previously conducted research that is available to the public. Secondary research includes published studies and government reports. Primary research is proprietary research that is not available to the public. Secondary research can be very useful because it can provide background information. It may help researchers refine the design of their primary research. It might actually answer the researcher's question, so the need for new primary research may be eliminated. Secondary research might alert researchers about problems they need to avoid. And it might provide information that will help researchers with their sampling. Here are some questions to ask when reviewing secondary research. The first question, who conducted the research? Two, for what purpose was the research done? Three, how were the data collected? Four, when were the data collected? Five, what is included in the data and what is not? Six, 
Are the findings consistent with other research? Secondary research has limitations. The first is that appropriate secondary research may not be available. Secondary research may be out of date. It may lack relevance for the problem being investigated. Secondary research may be inaccurate. While useful, it may not adequately address the problem under investigation. Here is the big question. Does the secondary research answer the research question? If the secondary research adequately answers the research question, primary research may not be needed. If the secondary research does not adequately answer the research question, primary research may be needed. Let's turn to research objectives. Research objectives must be SMART. Let's see what that means. The S in SMART stands for specific which means that the research goals must be clearly defined. The M stands for measurable, which means that the goals have clear measures from which the results can be judged. The A stands for achievable, which means the research goals can be accomplished. The R stands for relevant, which means the research goals are directed to solving an important problem. And T stands for timed, which means the research objectives state when the research will be finished. There are four types of research. The first is exploratory research. The second is descriptive research. The third is causal research. Causal research includes experiments or random controlled tests. The fourth type of research is meta-analysis. Let us turn to exploratory research. Exploratory research are preliminary studies designed to get a deeper understanding of a problem. Typically, with exploratory research, quantitative information is not obtained. No hypotheses are tested. Common exploratory research techniques include focus groups and in-depth interviews. Descriptive research. Descriptive research addresses questions of who, what, where, and when. Descriptive research can be qualitative or quantitative. Examples of descriptive research include observational studies, case studies, and surveys. There are two kinds of observational research. Observational research can be prospective, which means the data are collected as events occur. Observational research can also be retrospective, which means the data are collected after the events have occurred. Case studies are detailed investigations into one or two examples of an issue in hopes of finding lessons for all similar cases. With case studies, qualitative and quantitative data are collected. With surveys, respondents provide data by answering a questionnaire. Questionnaires are often called instruments. To avoid bias, the wording of a survey questionnaire is extremely important. Good surveys are valid and reliable. The concepts of validity and reliability will be reviewed later in this lecture. Causal research addresses why questions. It seeks to establish causal relationships. Causal research commonly employs controlled experiments to determine cause and effect. This research measures the concomitant variations between cause or causes and the effect. The cause must precede or come before the effect. As we shall see when we cover linear correlation and regression, cause and effect relationships can be established using large-scale observational studies. Observational research is a technique where participants and phenomena are observed in their most natural setting. In the 1940s and 1950s, the causal link between smoking and cancer 
was found using large-scale observational studies. The observational research of Austin Bradford Hill and Richard Dahl helped establish the link between smoking and cancer. Meta-analysis are sophisticated statistical techniques used to develop quantitative analysis of multiple studies on the same or similar subjects. Let's turn to big data. Big data are data sets with a huge volume of data. Big data also includes a wide variety of data. Big data is generated at a high velocity. The importance of big data is growing exponentially. Here are several examples of big data. Social media websites generate over 500 terabytes of data daily. A single jet engine generates over 10 terabytes of data per 30 minutes of flight time. The New York Stock Exchange generates one terabyte of new data daily. We will now turn to sampling techniques. There are two broad categories of sampling techniques, non-probability samples and probability samples. With non-probability samples, it is impossible to determine the probability that an individual member of the population will be included in the sample. There are four basic kinds of non-probability samples, convenience, quota, judgment, and snowball. Non-probability samples are not typically used in statistical analysis. With statistical research, we typically use probability samples because these samples can determine the probability that an individual will be included in the sample. There are four basic types of probability samples. One, simple random samples. Two, systematic samples. Three, stratified samples. And four, cluster samples. Simple random samples. With simple random samples, the sample is chosen by chance. Each element of the population has the same chance of being included in the sample, and this probability is known. Examples of simple random samples include the Mega Millions and Powerball lotteries. Finding the probability of a population element being selected in a sample is a simple fraction. Divide the population size by the sample size. If 50 items are selected from a population of 15,000, each population element has a 0.67% chance of being selected. Here are the cost advantages and disadvantages of simple random samples. Cost and use. One, simple random samples can be expensive because you need a sampling frame, which is the list of all the elements in the population. Two, the most common use is random phone dialing. Advantages. One, minimal advanced knowledge of the population is needed. Two, it is easy to analyze the data and computer error. Disadvantages. One, requires a sampling frame. Two, does not use established knowledge of the population. Three, larger sample error per sample size. Four, respondents may be widely dispersed. Systematic random samples. With systematic random samples, the population elements are ordered. A random starting point is selected. Then at a predetermined interval, a member of the population is selected. When the physical order of a population is related to an important characteristic, this method should not be used. Here are the costs, advantages, and disadvantages of systematic random samples. Cost and use. One, moderate cost. Two, moderate use. Advantages, easy to draw and easy to check. Disadvantage, the order of the population may introduce errors. Stratified samples. The population is first divided into subgroups, strata, based on important characteristics. A sample is then selected from each stratum. This ensures proportionate representation for each stratum. Here's an example of stratified sampling. A study of advertising spending for 400 large corporations 
sample size equals 50. Question. Do firms with high return on equity invest more in advertising? Draw a sample of companies grouped by return on equity. Here is what the stratified sample would look like. Here are the costs, advantages, and disadvantages of stratified samples. Cost and use. One, high cost. Two, moderate use. Advantages. One, ensures representation of all groups in the sample. Two, allows for estimates of the population and comparisons of strata. Three, reduces the variability of the sample. Disadvantages. One, requires accurate information of the proportion of each stratum. Two, if stratified lists are not available, it can be costly to develop these lists. Cluster samples. The population is first divided into subgroups called clusters. Then samples are randomly selected from the clusters. Example, determine citizens' views on environmental protection. Cluster sampling divides the population into smaller units or clusters. Random samples are then taken from a selected number of clusters. Here are the costs, advantages, and disadvantages of cluster samples. Cost and use. One, low cost. Two, frequent use. Advantages. One, geographic clusters yield the lowest field costs. Two, can accurately estimate characteristics of the clusters and populations. Disadvantage. Larger sample error than other sampling methods. Two, the researcher must assign members of the population to each cluster. Let's turn to random sampling error. Random sampling error occurs when the sample statistic does not equal the population parameter. Random sampling error is not due to human error. Researchers expect all samples to have some degree of sampling error. As we shall see in future lectures, sampling error is a major issue in inferential statistics. Now let's review systematic errors. Systematic errors are human errors made in the design and execution of research. There are two broad categories of systematic errors. The first category is sample design errors, which are errors in how the sampling was conducted the second category of systematic errors are measurement errors. These errors are made when the collected data are analyzed. Measurement errors can occur with samples and populations. Here are the types of sample design errors. Frame errors are a kind of sample design error. A sample frame is a list of all elements of the population. A frame error occurs when sample frames are inaccurate. Frame error biases, distorts research results. Population specification error is a type of sample design error. These errors are the result of incorrectly defining the population. Another type of design error is selection error. Even with an accurate sample frame and a properly defined population, selection errors may happen. Selection errors occur when the sampling procedures are not properly followed or the procedures are poorly thought out. Here is an example of selection error. An interviewer avoids interviewing certain types of people. Another type of sample design error is surrogate information error. This type of error is due to inconsistency between the information sought and the information needed to solve the problem. Surrogate information errors arise when the researcher fails to understand how respondents view the questions. Here are the types of measurement errors. Measurement errors occur after data have been collected. Processing errors are errors in coding, transcribing, assigning weights to the data, as well as the use of inappropriate statistical techniques. Interviewer error is another form of measurement error. These errors occur when the interviewer consciously or unconsciously influences respondents' answers. 
Respondent's reaction to the interviewer may introduce bias. Instrument or questionnaire bias is a measurement error. The use of leading questions, questions that have an embedded answer, bias results. Here's an example of a leading question. How dumb was President Obama's policy on North Korea? Loaded questions are another form of instrument or questionnaire bias. A loaded question contains unjustified assumptions that skew responses. Here's an example of a loaded question. Do you think the liberal media push fake news to undermine President Trump? Another form of instrument or questionnaire bias are double barrel questions. A double barrel question poses two or more questions in a single question. Here's an example of a double barrel question. Would you vote for a candidate who supports cutting spending on education and health care? This question is actually two questions. The first about spending cuts for education, the second about spending cuts for health care. There are three types of response bias. The first is acquiescence bias, which is the tendency of respondents to agree with all questions or to answer all questions with positive responses. The second form of response bias is extremity bias, which is the tendency of respondents to use extremely positive or negative responses. The third form of response bias is auspices bias. This is the tendency of respondents to be influenced by the study's sponsor. In addition to response bias, there is non-response bias. This is the bias that occurs when respondents fail to participate fully in the survey. Non-response bias is the theoretical bias between a perfect survey in which everyone participates and the actual survey. Self-selection bias is a non-response bias that occurs when respondents that have strongly positive or negative views are overrepresented. This bias is related to extremity bias. There are also three important experimental errors. These errors are reactive effects that happen when respondents know that they are participating in a study. The Hawthorne effect occurs when participants do not behave normally because they know they are in a study. A placebo effect occurs when all participants show positive results regardless of what treatment they are assigned. A John Henry effect occurs when participants in a control group work harder because they know they are participating in a study. Let's turn to two very important concepts, reliability and validity. Reliability refers to the consistency of a questionnaire's results. When a questionnaire returns consistent results, it is said to be reliable. Validity, on the other hand, refers to the accuracy of the measurements. Here is a representation of a survey with poor validity and good reliability. Validity is poor because the shots are out of the bullseye, which is to say it is not accurately measuring the concepts being studied, but the survey is reliable because the shots are tightly grouped, which is to say the results are consistent. The second graphic at the center of the screen represents a survey with poor validity and poor reliability because the shots are widely dispersed and off the bullseye. In essence, the survey results fail to measure the concept accurately and the results are inconsistent. The last graphic on the right represents a survey with good reliability and good validity because the shots are tightly grouped in the bullseye. The survey accurately and consistently measures the concepts. There are four kinds of reliability. The first is test-retest reliability. The second is equivalent form reliability. The third is internal consistency reliability. And the fourth is inner rater consistency. Test-retest reliability. With test-retest reliability, respondents are given the survey at two different times under similar conditions. When there are few differences, the questionnaire is considered reliable. 
problems with test retest reliability. It may be difficult or impossible to get respondents to complete the questionnaire twice. The administration of the first survey may cause a respondent's answers to change. Extraneous factors in the environment may cause the respondent's answers to change. Equivalent form reliability. With equivalent form reliability, similar surveys are used to determine whether they yield similar results. When the results are similar, the surveys are considered reliable. Internal consistency reliability. Internal consistency reliability is when a questionnaire returns similar measurements when given to different samples during the same time period. There are a variety of techniques used to establish internal consistency reliability. One method is the split ballot technique. Questions that probe the same construct are divided into two groups of equal numbers of questions. Cronbox Alpha is a statistical technique that calculates the mean reliability scores for all possible ways of splitting the questions. With Cronbox Alpha, the internal consistency of a questionnaire is measured on this scale. An alpha of greater than or equal to 90% has excellent reliability. An alpha greater than or equal to 80% but less than 90% has good reliability. An alpha that is greater than or equal to 70%, but less than 80% has acceptable reliability, and so forth. Inter-rater reliability. Inter-rater reliability is based on how independent observers compare their assessments when they observe the same behavior. An example of inter-rater reliability are the consistency of judges' scores on Olympic skaters. Validity deals with how accurately a questionnaire measures a concept or construct. To repeat, questionnaires are often called survey instruments. There are two critical definitions for constructs or concepts. Theoretical definitions state the essential meaning of a construct. An operational definition of a construct is a description of how the construct will be measured. There are several types of validity. The lowest kinds of validity are face validity and content validity. There are two types of criterion validity, concurrent validity and predictive validity. And there are two types of construct validity, Convergent validity and discriminant validity. Face and content validity are non quantitative forms of validity. Face validity is the degree to which non experts judge the results to be accurate. Face validity is not considered a strong measure of validity. Content validity is the degree to which experts judge the results to be accurate. Content validity is also not considered a strong measure of validity. There are two types of criterion validity. Both concurrent validity and predictive validity predict a designated criterion. Concurrent validity is the degree to which one variable can be predicted by the instrument concurrently at the same time with another variable of interest. We have concurrent validity when there is a predictive relationship among the variables. Predictive validity is the degree to which the future value of a criterion variable can be predicted by the survey. The SAT exam has predictive validity if they predict students' academic performance in college. There are two types of construct validity. Convergent validity and discriminant validity are the degrees to which the questionnaire accurately measures the construct. Conversion validity measures the strength of an association among different questions or questionnaires that purport to measure the same construct. When the measures for these constructs are similar, when they converge, we have convergent validity. Discriminant validity measures the lack of association among constructs that are supposed to be different. We have discriminant validity when test results show that measures that are supposed to be dissimilar 
are in fact dissimilar. Here are 11 questions skeptics ask when reviewing research. 1. Have the study's goals been clearly identified? 2. Has the study's methodology been described? 3. Who funded the study? Does the identity of the funders raise any concerns? 4. Have any other researchers replicated the study's results? 5. Is the sample size sufficient? When we get to inferential statistics, we will discuss how sample sizes are determined along with related concepts like effect size. 6. Are the variables adequately defined and properly measured? 7. Is the questionnaire, the survey instrument, reliable and valid? 8. Have potential sources of systematic errors been identified? 9. Are the tables and charts misleading? 10. Are there any alternate explanations? 11. Did the researchers use appropriate statistical techniques? Except where otherwise noted, clear-sighted statistics is licensed under a Creative Commons license. You are free to share derivatives of this work for non-commercial purposes only. Please attribute this work to Edward Volchak. You can access clear-sighted statistics for free along with its Excel and PowerPoint files on the CUNY Commons. The URL is https forward slash forward slash cuny dot manifold app dot org forward slash projects forward slash clear dash cited dash statistics.